It's good to be back here with all of you and to be able to share the word together, right? It's wonderful to always join together with God's people in God's house, right? It's a blessing. I know David said it's better to be in God's courts, right, than a thousand days elsewhere. So we are blessed to be here. Well, before we get into the word this morning, let's have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much that we can be here in this place of worship. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to study your word. And we ask, Lord, for the special blessing of your spirit that you would teach us and guide us and impress us with the truth of your scriptures. Lord, we know that you have a message for us this morning, and we pray that your spirit would just impress that message upon our hearts and bring it to life that we might see your truth in the scriptures. For this, Lord, we pray. And thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Our message this morning is words spoken before God. Words spoken before God. I think about a story many years ago in the year 1505. That is a lot of years ago, right? 1505. A young man by the name of Martin was running through a forest in Germany. And as he was out there in that forest, something happened. He saw some large clouds moving his direction, large, black, threatening clouds. And out here in Oklahoma, we're familiar with those kind of clouds. Those clouds had thunder and lightning in them. It was a big lightning storm. And that uh, big thunderhead of those clouds came rolling over the forest where Martin was. And as Martin was there, giant bolts of lightning started striking coming down into the trees, uh, hitting the ground around him. And as you can imagine, he was utterly terrified. You're sitting in the midst of a bunch of trees with lightning hitting all around you. He was so scared that he cried out to God, but he didn't really know how to address God. And so being raised as a good Catholic, he thought about St. Anne. And he decided, well, I'll call out to St. Anne, meaning to get a message to God, right? And as he called out, he said, Lord, if you save me, I will become a priest. If you save me from this, I will become a priest and serve you. And guess what happened? Very quickly, the storm cleared right up. The clouds went away and his life was spared. Wow, he was certain that this was coming from God. And what had he done? He had made a promise. He said, Lord, if you save me from this storm, I will become a priest. He made a vow to God. He made a promise to God. And he thought, you know, God saved me. I have to keep my promise. I have to become a priest. And this young man named Martin, we know him today as Martin Luther, right? Martin Luther, uh, who was one of the major players in the Reformation, bringing back Bible truth to multitudes of people. Well, praise God for young people and anyone who keeps their promises to God, right? So he kept his promise to God, and he became a priest, and God definitely used him. Now, have we made promises to God before? Have you ever done that? Made some promises to God, or maybe thought about making promises to God? And the next question is, have we been faithful in keeping those promises to God? Sometimes, sometimes we might not. B, but uh, have we been faithful in keeping our promises to Him? So today we're going to look at the Bible's counsel in regard to making promises, vows, or promises. What does God say about these things? What are some of the examples we have in Scripture, and what can we learn about this business of making promises? We already read this morning about letting our words be, be few before God, right? He is God in heaven, so we better speak carefully before the Lord of all heaven and earth. Now, if we have our Bibles handy, we can turn over to Genesis 14. I'd like to look at the story of Abraham right there in Genesis chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 21 and following. Genesis 14, verse 21 up to 24. And here the Bible says, And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, 
I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. Save only that which the young men have eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anner, Eskel, and Mamre, let them take their portion. So, I think a number of us may be familiar with this story. Lot had been captured, and a number of other uh, people in the area had been captured, and Abraham got his men, and he went out, and he fought with these persons who had captured Lot, and he conquered them, right? And he rescued Lot, and he brought him back, and they, they had all these spoils, and they were saying, well, Abraham, go ahead and take all the spoils. But what did Abraham say? No, thank you, right? I'm not going to take those, right? I was just here to save Lot and help everybody out here, and I don't need all those rewards. And he said that he had lifted up his hand to God. He had sworn to God that he would take nothing for himself in this, right? That he didn't want anything. So he made that promise to God. And when faced with this offering of all these riches, he said no, right? Because he wanted God to receive the praise, right? He wanted God to be honored. He didn't want these other folks to say, well, we made you rich. You know, we gave you all these spoils of war. No, he said, I won't take anything in this. I'm just not going to do it. And some people might not feel comfortable with that. Some people might say, well, hey, I'd like all that money, right? <laughs> hey, I'd like all those riches. Well, we, we did a service, so I might as well take them. But Abraham said, no, I'm not going to take those things. I'm just going to leave them because I want God to receive all the glory. So Abraham made a vow to God. And he kept it, didn't he? He kept it, even in the face of what we might consider temptation, right? To take all those goods, all those spoils of war. But he said, no, I'm not going to do it. He was a man of integrity, wasn't he? A man of honor. He kept his word to God, even when faced with those worldly advantages that were being offered to him. So praise God for people like Abraham. Now, there's another story in the Bible, in the book of Judges. Let's turn on over there. Judges 11. After the books of Moses, we should find Joshua and then Judges. Judges chapter 11. And we're going to look here from verse 29. All right, Judges 11, verse 29. And this is a story of of Jephthah. Are we familiar with this person in Scripture? Jephthah? <laughs> Some people who know the story don't like the story very much. I wonder why. Well, we're going to read the story. We'll see what happens here in this story. So, verse 29 and verse 30 say this, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpah of Gilead, and from Mizpah of Gilead he passed over unto the children of Ammon. And Jephthah vowed a vow unto the Lord, and said, If thou shalt without fail uh, deliver the children of Ammon into mine hands, then it shall be that whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, uh, shall surely be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over unto the children of Ammon to fight against them, and the Lord delivered them into his hands. And Jephthah made a vow that day. He was going into battle, right? He was going to a fight with the children of Ammon, and he wanted God's help. He wanted God's protection, right? And he said, Lord, if you give me victory today over these people, the children of Ammon, then he said, I will give you an offering. When I come home, the first thing that comes out of the door to meet me, I'm going to give that as an offering to you, right? Now, he might have wanted to think that through a little bit, you know, perhaps, when you know the end of the story. But he only had one daughter, and his daughter was at home, all right? So, What's likely to happen? Who's likely to come out and greet him when he first gets back home? Yeah, his daughter. So God 
honored his part of the bargain. Jephthah made the deal. God didn't make it, but God said, all right, Jephthah, is that what you want to do? And he gives him the battle. And so now God has fulfilled his side of it. What's left? Well, now Jephthah needs to fulfill his side of it. So he goes home and out comes his daughter. First one he sees. Out comes his daughter. He's like, oh no, my child. You can see there's some kind of grief in his experience that, oh no, I'm going to have to give my daughter as an offering. And he said here, according to King James, it says even a burnt offering. Now, whoa, that would be terrible. Burning. Do we do that? Do we burn human beings? Is that what God wants us to do? No, that's not what God wants us to do, right? So he had made this vow. Out comes his daughter. He's grieved. He tells his daughter, she's just a young lady. She's a young virgin. She goes out and she weeps on the mountaintops with her friends and she weeps for her virginity because she's going to be dedicated to the Lord and she's not going to be able to marry. Now, some people thought, well, did he like offer her as a burnt offering? There's no record of him doing that, but there is a record of him giving her to the Lord. I don't think it would have honored God if he said, I'm going to take my daughter and burn her because God says he doesn't do that right? That we don't do that. That's not pleasing to God. That's offensive to God. When the heathen did that, God was offended by it. When they made their children to pass through the fire, you've heard of that in the Old Testament, God was offended by those things. He did not want those kind of things to happen. So obviously, she wouldn't be given to the fire. That would not honor God. But she could be given fully dedicated to the service of God. She wouldn't lead a normal life, you know, having kids and raising up a family. And so she went out and wept because now her life was going to be quite different than what she had imagined, what she had planned, right? And, uh, and he fulfilled his vow, even though it seemed like it was pretty difficult to him, right? Like maybe it hurt him somehow because he wasn't going to have a bunch of grandkids running around from his only daughter. Wow, we should be careful the kind of vows that we make, right? Because even if it's really difficult, we may have to fulfill those vows because we've made a promise, right? And God kept up on his side of the bargain. Maybe we can make a better deal, right? <laughs> but he had to fulfill his words, and so he did. He kept his vow. He kept his promise. Now, there's another story in the New Testament about some men who made a vow. And let's take a look at that vow in the book of Acts, chapter 23. Acts chapter 23. Let's go there to learn about what happened in the time of the early church, the early Christian church. We have here in Acts chapter 23. We're going to look at verse 12. Acts 23. And we'll be looking there at verse 12. And the Bible says, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse. This is an oath. Saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. So Paul was one of God's faithful missionaries, right? He wrote a, a large majority of the New Testament with his letters to the churches. Paul had been converted from his staunch Jewish background, right, to follow Christ and to not follow the traditions of the elders. He met Jesus, but you know the story. He was fighting against Christians first, right? And then God converted him, and God made him a missionary. And so Paul was traveling the world as a missionary for Jesus Christ, sharing the good news of Christ. Well, this infuriated many of the Jews in Jerusalem who knew him before as fighting for their cause. They were very upset about Paul. And so anytime he would come to Jerusalem, he would end up having troubles with these guys, right? And they wanted to kill him. They wanted to get Paul out of there, right? And the Bible tells us here that a number of Jews banded together and they bound themselves under a curse, under a very solemn oath that they would not eat or drink until they had killed Paul right? That for sure they were going to kill Paul. So you have all these guys, and the Bible says in verse 13, they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. 40 people who took this very solemn oath. They were not going to eat or drink until for sure they had killed the apostle Paul. Now let's take a look at verse 21. 
in this chapter. But do not thou yield unto them, for there lie in wait for him of them more than forty men, which have bound themselves with an oath that they will neither eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, looking for a promise from thee. So this was the, this was the governor, the guy who was overseeing, actually I think it was the, the military officer, he was overseeing the safety of Paul. They had taken Paul into custody, and a young boy related to Paul knew about the situation. He had overheard these men making the oath, and he went to tell the commander in charge. So he came and reported about these men and their oath. So immediately, the guy pulls together his troops, and he says, we have to protect Paul. We have to get him out of here, because all of these men are trying to kill him. So God, of course, was working for the protection of his servant Paul. And God pulled together all of these soldiers, these law enforcement personnel, to take care of Paul, right? To protect him. And so God was ultimately working in this. God was working fully to protect Paul. And notice what we find in chapter 24 and verse 27 of Acts. Chapter 24 and verse 27. This is what it says. But after two years, Portius Festus came into Felix's room, and Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. So here we are two years later, and Paul's still bound in prison, but Paul's still alive. Paul hasn't been killed, amen? God protected Paul there in uh, prison, in confinement, as he, was, as he was there. So how about these guys? Forty guys, they said they're not going to eat or drink until Paul's dead. Well, two years later, Paul's still alive. So what happened to those 40 guys that swore under a solemn oath they were not going to eat or drink until Paul was dead? Well, either they died or they broke their oath, right? It's only one of two choices. Okay, you're not going to last two years without water and food. You've got to take something. So they had a solemn oath, and I, I sort of wonder how that played out. There were 40 of them. Did, did many of them you know, break their oath? Did all of them break their oath? Was it, you know, some who broke it and the other ones just ended up in the grave? I don't know, right? Some people, they might not have changed their oath. They said, well, we're bound. So you have to be careful what kind of oaths you're making, right, if you do. God does want us to keep our promises, and He doesn't want us to be making promises and then breaking promises. But thank God for His mercy, right? Amen. We serve a merciful God. So let's find out what are some of the biblical principles and guidelines that God has concerning oaths or vows or promises. Does God have some biblical guidelines? Let's take a look in Numbers chapter 30. So going to the Old Testament, looking at Numbers, the fourth book in our Bible. We'll look at Numbers and chapter 30. And there in chapter 30, of Numbers, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. The Bible actually does give counsel on these kinds of things. Verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. So, does God want us to be serious about what we promise to him? What we say to him? He does, right? He says, if we choose to make a vow to God about something, then we should do it. We should fulfill it. That's what God is saying. So he does give us counsel on this matter, right? God lets us know very clearly what his expectations are. If we of our own free will decide to make this promise to God, then the Lord expects that we will keep our word, that we will do it. You know, when God makes promises to us, does he keep those promises? Can we depend upon God's promises? Can we take them to the bank, right? And know that they're, they're good? Those promises are good, right? All of God's promises are good. All of them are true, right? And if God is this way to us, 
Isn't it right that he should expect us to be the same to him, to be true and faithful? That we would develop a character like unto the character of God, where his word is always true and we can trust it, and we are faithful also in our promises to him, that we would have those same characteristics as the Lord has. I think that is a wonderful uh, you know, teaching there in Scripture, that God wants us to be true to our words. So it is a sin to break our vows before God. Let's take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 23. That's the next book in our Bible. We'll look at chapter 23 and verse 21. Deuteronomy 23 and the verse is 21. The Bible says here, When thou shalt vow a vow unto the Lord thy God, thou shalt not slack to pay it, for the Lord thy God will surely require it of thee, and it would be sin in thee. So if we decided to break our vow unto God, the Bible says that would be a sin, right? That would be wrong of us. Verse 22 and 23 say, But if thou shalt forbear to vow, it shall be no sin in thee. So if you don't make a promise, well, then there's not a sin, right? But if you do make a promise and then you don't keep the promise to God, that is actually a sin, right? Because we've not kept our word to God. We need to have integrity, right? We need to be honest and keep our word. And so we find also in the verse following, which is verse 23, that which has gone out of thy lips, thou shalt keep and perform even a free will offering according as thou hast vowed unto the Lord thy God, which thou hast promised with thy mouth. It's of our own free choice, right? It's a free will offering. We've decided to make that vow and that promise to God. And the Lord says we should keep it. If we make it, we should keep it. We should honor those words and have integrity. And the Bible tells us that we should not be hasty in making oaths. And I think that makes a lot of sense, right? When we look at this, don't be so quick. Be careful about it, right? When we make a vow before God. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at Ecclesiastes 5, which is where we read a verse from this morning just before we began. So Ecclesiastes chapter 5, that's right towards the middle of our Bible. It's after Proverbs. You should be able to find Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and we'll go to chapter 5, starting from verse 1. And this is what it says. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God, and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth. Therefore, let thy words be few. All right, let our words be few. So don't be hasty, the Bible says. Be careful about the kinds of promises that we want to make before God, right? And the kinds of vows that we want to make before God. It says, do not be rash. Don't rush into it, right? Don't be hasty. But think it through and make sure that you want to keep those vows. And then it continues on, verse 3, For a dream cometh through the multitude of business, and a fool's voice is known by multitude of words. Too many words can be a bad thing. Verse 4, When thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow, than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. Ah, huh. well that's good principle, right? <laughs> Better not to make a vow than to actually make the vow and then not pay. And this is pretty much true in life, right? When you make a promise for something, uh, you better keep it. We better learn how to keep our word. Make sure that that promise is something that you can make, right? That you can actually keep good on. It's important that we do that. And so it continues on here in verse 6. Suffer not your mouth to cause your flesh to sin. Neither say thou before the angel that it was an error. Wherefore should God be angry at thy voice and destroy the work of thine hands? 
For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there are also diverse vanities, but fear thou God, right? In other words, respect God, love and reverence God. So the Bible says here a lot of things about staying true to our word, right? If we make a vow, if we make a promise, we should keep that. We should definitely keep the promise. Now, some years ago, I had a friend, he's still a friend of mine, great guy, uh, but we were in college and he told me that he had made a vow to God and he was going to read this book on the life of Christ. You might know it by the Desire of Ages, the name Desire of Ages, you might know that book. This book is 835 pages long. It's a long book, right? It's a great book, but it's a long book. And so he had made a promise, he had made a vow to God, and he said, I'm not going to shave my face until I finish reading that book. And I thought, huh, that's a long book, and he's just getting started on it. <laughs> uh, he's going to have a lot of hair coming down real far. And I, I said, wow, that's quite a task, right? I, I hope you're a good reader and you can be able to get that done. And so he thought about it, but he had already made that vow, and he even let me know that he made that vow. Well, within a couple of weeks, I was walking across campus and, and saw him. Lo and behold, his beard was shaved. I said, oh, did you finish the book? Oh, no, man, I, was, I didn't finish it. I, I couldn't do it. It was too much. It was too long. He's trying to do, balance all of his classes and work and everything else, and he had this vow. He said, I just couldn't do it. And I was like, oh, okay, well, sorry to hear that, right? And so here he had this situation where he had to go and apologize to God because he didn't actually keep his word to God. And the Bible says that's a sin if we don't keep our word to God, right? He had made a vow. That was his own free choice to make that vow. Unfortunately, he didn't keep it. And that's not a good thing. It has a negative effect on us. It has a bad effect on our relationship with God, and it can affect our relationship with others, too, when we don't keep our promises, when we don't keep our word. And so, you know, I thank God for His mercy, right? I thank God for His forgiveness, that if we have failed Him, yes, we'll look like a fool, yes, we'll feel bad, yes, we have done wrong, but God can still forgive us. And I praise God for that, right? I praise God that He can forgive us when we have done wrong in such a way. Praise God for that mercy. But it doesn't mean, because God is merciful, that we should just go and be presumptuous and make vows and promises that we're not even going to keep, right? We can't go and live a life of presumption. We must live a life of integrity instead, right? A life where we honor God and our word actually means something. And our promises actually mean something. Jesus said, let your yes be yes, and let your no be no, right? To be clear, to be straightforward, to be honest, and to let our word be something with integrity, right? To have integrity there, so that people can trust and believe what we have to say. Now, there's a wonderful verse in Psalm chapter 15. So if you have your Bibles, let's go to Psalm 15 which talks about the righteous, the character of the righteous. Psalms 15. And I will be looking there at verse 1 and 4. So Psalm 15, verse 1 and 4. Notice here, verse 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? The question is, who is going to be in the presence of God, right? Who will be able to dwell with a holy God in heaven? And it goes on to list a number of characteristics of the righteous, how they are faithful to God, how they do not do wickedness, right? They speak the truth. And it goes on to list a number of things. And then notice verse, uh, verse 4. It says, In whose eyes a vile person is contemned, which means disliked or um, you know you, you recognize that evil is evil and then it says but he honoreth them that fear the Lord he that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not 
So this is one of the characteristics of the righteous who will be in the presence of God. It says that they swear to their own hurt, right? That they've made a promise and in the end, they get the short end of the stick, right? Or the short stick, whichever it is, okay? So somehow they got a bad deal. They made a promise, they made a vow, and they came up short, right? They didn't get the better side of the deal. And he says here that he swears to his own hurt, but changes not. That even if I got the short end of the deal, but I still made a promise, and I decided to do that, and a promise is a promise, and I'm going to keep my word. It's better to have your integrity and lose the better part of a deal than to lose your integrity and have all the goods in the world, right? It's better to have our integrity and forget all the stuff and be true to our word. That's a lot more important because you're not going to take stuff to heaven, but character you will take to heaven. Amen? We need to have a godly character. We need to follow God's way and to be able to, to make promises and not change, even if it's to our own hurt. I think about poor Jephthah that we read about this morning, right? Uh, but God blessed him anyway, and God blessed his family, even in their situation where he didn't exactly like the outcome, but still God made something good out of it. So, yeah, there's a lot we can learn about vows. And I think about the vows that Jesus made. Do you know Jesus made some promises to us? I mean, he's made a lot, hasn't he? There was a promise that Jesus made many, many years ago that he was going to come and give his life for you and me if we messed up, right? If we sin. The Bible says that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We have that in Revelation 13, 8. So Jesus from the very beginning promised that he would come to this earth and give his life in exchange for our lives if we had committed sin and were worthy of death. He made that promise. Now, do you think Jesus really wanted to lay aside all the comforts of heaven and the praise of the angels and come down here to this messed up world and walk among us and then have his face spit on and be mocked and beaten and hung on a cross with a crown of thorns piercing his brow? Did Jesus really want to go and do all that? Like, was it, in, was it for his personal good? I don't think it was for his personal good, right? But the Bible says that he... he endured the cross, right? He endured it, despising the shame because of the hope and the joy that was set before him, right? Because he knew that on the other side of all this suffering, something good was going to happen. That you and I could be saved, right? That we could be saved from death, saved from our sin. And Jesus said, you know what? It's worth it. And when Jesus came down to the moment of fulfillment, you know that's the most critical moment, isn't it? Right? When you're thinking about something bad in the future that's coming, you're like, oh, I still have a while. And in Jesus' case, he's like, I still have a couple thousand years, you know. I mean, just think about it. He's had a long time to think about this plan. And, and he, he was waiting for this appointment for thousands of years to come here on, on this earth and die for us, right? We don't have appointments scheduled that far in advance, do we? But he did. So he came down to it. And the most critical moment is like when you're right there. Like, it's going to happen, you know. Pretty much this is either you go and do this or you don't go and do this. And we see that moment for Jesus when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane on Thursday night before he went to the cross the next day, before he was taken captive by the soldiers and then mocked and beaten before the priests. Before Jesus went into that, the Bible says that he was in the Garden of Gethsemane on his knees. He was praying for help because he knew that in his own strength, he was weak. As a human being, he was weak. In his own strength, it wasn't enough, right? Jesus constantly depended on his heavenly Father. He constantly depended on God to be able to keep his promises, right? So he knelt there in the garden and he prayed, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, right? Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus surrendered his own will, his own desire, to the will of the Father. And when Jesus surrendered to the will of the Father, he won that victory on his knees, right? He won the victory of Calvary right there on his knees in the garden. The Bible says that God sent angels to strengthen him, to brace him for what he was about to do. 
And when those soldiers came marching up to him in the garden, Peter was ready to pull out his sword, and he did. He took a man's ear off, right? So, yeah, he was like, let's fight. Like, we're going to take these guys down. But Jesus said, no, Peter, this is not the way we're going to do it. He said, I'm going to go. And so when they called out, where's Jesus? He said, I'm he, I'm right here. Jesus didn't go running. He didn't go hiding. He said, no, I'm here. He was ready to face it. He knew what he had to do. He knew what the promise was, that he was the Savior and he had to die for the sins of the world. So he said, I'm not going to run. Yeah, it's going to hurt. It doesn't feel good. It's shameful, but I'm going to do it. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. And those soldiers came up to him and they were shocked by it. But they took him into custody and Jesus went through with the entire ordeal and he hung on that cross for you and me. He hung on that cross for our sins because we have not been faithful to God. We have broken our vows to God in many ways, right? Jesus hung on that cross to pay the price for our sins, to show us what it means to answer before God. I praise God for the love of Jesus. I praise God for the integrity of Jesus, that he didn't just turn and say, I'm not doing it, forget that cross. No, he said, I'm going to do it. And he prayed, and he got the strength from God. We, in our own lives, need to depend on God's strength, right? We need to depend on him. He is the one who can give us a life of integrity. He is the one who can help us to be true to everything, to vows or whatever it is, to be faithful to God. We need to hold on to Jesus and have that grace and strength. Amen? Amen. We need to hold on to Him. And as I think about our lives, you know, we have a number of vows that we make in life, hopefully not too many, but some of those vows that we make are baptismal vows, right? This is one of the vows that we make in our lives when we come to the Lord Jesus and we are baptized. We are saying, Lord, I'm going to put away the old life and I'm promising to seek you and to live a new life, to walk in Jesus Christ. When we are baptized, we're saying that. We're making a promise to God before witnesses, aren't we? That we are going to be true to Jesus Christ. That we have decided to leave the old life behind. To not follow the world, but to follow Christ. That's a vow. That's a promise that we make in this life. And it's pretty much the most important decision we have to make in this life. Now, I would say probably the second most important decision is the decision to marry somebody. Right? Do we make vows when we get married? We do, right? That's another vow that we make. And we make that vow before God, don't we? Before God and witnesses that we are going to be true to the other person, right? And they make the same vow to us that they're going to be true. And today just happens to be my five-year anniversary. Uh, my wife and I are celebrating it, October 9. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, five years ago, on this day, we were married. We made vows, right? <laughs> and, uh, you know, we've been true to those vows. Five years later, praise the Lord, right? And, you know, I want to keep being true to those vows, amen? To keep on all the way. Because in those vows we say, until death do us part, right? Until death do us part. And the Bible actually makes that rule, doesn't it? It says that we're bound to each other. As long as we both shall live. The Bible actually teaches that. So yes, there are vows that we make in this life. And God wants us to be true to these vows. So this morning as we're thinking about the vows that God wants us to make, I wonder, would we like today, this morning, to affirm our vows? To say, Lord, you know, I made a commitment to you and I want to be true to that commitment. I want to be true to Jesus Christ. That's one of the vows that we could affirm this morning. And if we're married and we've made vows in that way, would you like to also say, I want to be true to those vows, true to those marriage vows? And I know, we've talked about it, not every life has been perfect, right? Not every decision. We've had, you know, problems. Some people may be listening to this recording, may have been through a situation of broken vows and unfaithfulness. That's a hurtful thing, isn't it? It's a very hurtful thing. But God's calling us to a new way in Christ, right? We can't go back and change the past, but we can make our choice about the future, amen? To say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to follow you. I want to be true, and I want to be faithful to keep my vows before God, whichever vows those are. So this morning, if you'd like to be faithful to the vows before God, 
whichever vows those are, would you like to stand with me this morning and say, Lord Jesus, help me to be faithful. Lord, I want to be faithful to those vows, whether it's baptism vows, whether it's marriage vows, or maybe it's some other kind of vow that we have made in our life. Let us say, Lord, I want to be true to you. Help me and strengthen me as you strengthen Jesus to face the cross. Lord, may you strengthen me. Amen. Let's pray together as we close. Our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your blessings in our lives. We thank you that you give us so many incredible teachings in your word about how to be true and how to be faithful. Lord, we want to say this morning that we would like our vows and our lives to be faithful, that we would be faithful to our significant other, that we would be faithful to you with our promises to follow Jesus Christ, with our baptismal vows. And Lord, in all things that we say or do, let us be faithful and true that people can know that our words actually mean something, that we are following the example of Christ and that we are living a life of integrity and honor. I pray, Lord, may it be so for all of us. For this we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, you guys. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time.